here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We're speaking to Spencer Ackerman of The Guardian. Last week, he published a story headlined, Bad Lieutenant, American Police Brutality Exported from Chicago to Guantanamo. The article looked at Richard Zuli, who used torture to extract confessions from minorities for years in Chicago, and then went on to work at Guantanamo. This is a clip of Lethariel Boyd, one of the innocent men Zuli interrogated in Chicago. I was mounted to the wall and floor. I remained in that room through two lineups. And um, I remember I asked, uh, after that second lineup, I asked Zuli if um, anybody had picked me out of the lineup. And he said, no. And I said, see? I told you, they got the wrong guy. I haven't done anything. He smiled at me and said, uh, we're charging you anyway. Ethereal Boyd served 23 years in prison before he was found to be wrongfully convicted. The lead interrogator during the most intense, torturous period of Salahi's interrogation was a Chicago police officer named Richard Zuli. And I thought, well, I had never heard about uh, a U.S. police officer uh, being in, in any U.S. Uh, military or, or intelligence uh, interrogation facility. What must his record in Chicago have been like? Uh, and from there, uh, found some court cases, including Lethereal Boyd's federal civil rights case against Zuli, uh, got in contact with his lawyer, found out about some more cases, and started uh, pulling records to find out uh, what this guy's record in Chicago was. And we found some really ominous parallels between how he policed Chicago's streets and what he did in Guantanamo Bay torture centers. And what happened with Lethereal, ultimately? Lethereal Boyd, uh, after 23 years of being put in prison on a murder that there was never any physical evidence that he committed, uh, was found uh, in 2013 by an investigation from the Cook County State's attorney uh, to have his conviction voided as it was completely baseless, and they found there was no evidence that could justify keeping him in prison, even though he had served 23 years. And the suit? And now, after he got out, they filed, Lethereal Boyd and his attorney, Kathleen Zellner, uh, filed a civil rights suit to try and get some kind of justice for Lethereal, uh, and as well, uh, try and create, uh, create both more disclosure around the way Chicago police practices have, at, have, uh, have operated, including Richard Zulis. Spencer Ackerman, if you can talk about this, and then also talk about whether the Chicago media is following up on these explosive reports where you're making these connections. Now, as we were uh, reporting this, we found that there were these connections between the way Zuli tortured uh, Slahi and his uh, uh, police work as a Chicago detective. Slahi was short shackled for extended periods of time. We found that happened to Ethereal Boyd. We found that happened to Benita Johnson. We found that happened to Andre Griggs. Uh, Johnson and Griggs, for instance, uh, were shackled for uh, between, they say, uh, 24 and 30 hours in their cases. Uh, Andre Griggs was suffering through heroin withdrawal during that time, and he wasn't given medication for that. Uh, and this was done as a, as a method to try and uh, get Griggs and Johnson uh, to confess to crimes that they say they never committed. Those confessions uh, form the vast majority of the evidence against them. Uh, and this was something that we saw as well from Zui doing uh, at Guantanamo. He told Slahi, uh, you can either be a witness or you can be a defendant. Uh, all he had to do was confess. Slahi's torture, much like with, with Griggs and with Johnson, uh, was so bad that eventually he just said, I'll sign whatever you put in front of me. He, as he put it in his book, what, if you want to buy, I am selling. Uh, before that happened is just one of the methods that Zuli employed. Zuli threatened to have his mother taken to Guantanamo Bay in what he described as its all-male environment. I don't think it's, it's particularly hard to understand that to be a rape threat. Better. Nevertheless, there is a context for this in Chicago. There's a long-standing tradition of police abuses primarily against African-American uh, residents of Chicago. It sits now with what we're reporting at this uncomfortable intersection between both that long and nefarious history of abuse against African-Americans primarily in Chicago and this post-9-11 era in which uh, secret detentions, long-time interrogations without charge and so forth uh, seem to be now increasing increasingly influencing domestic police work.